This video is brought to you by Nebula. At the beginning of October, the United Nations Security Council authorised the deployment of an international security force to Haiti in a bid to help the Caribbean nation quell surging gang violence and restore security. So in this video, we'll take a look at what's going on in Haiti and how it got into such a dire situation, discuss the new international security force and explain why some have been calling for it and why it might prove controversial. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Haiti, particularly the capital Port-au-Prince, has been rocked by surging gang violence in recent years. This year alone there have been more than 3,000 murders reported and over 1,500 instances of kidnapping. Armed gangs control most of the capital, as well as the main routes in and out of the city, creating shortages of key goods. Homicide, sexual violence, kidnappings and extortion have forced some 200,000 people to flee their homes. Adding to the complicated picture is the emergence of civilian vigilante groups carrying out their own killings of suspected criminals and gang members. Beyond the violence itself, Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, is dealing with a whole load of other problems, including a cholera outbreak, food insecurity and a dysfunctional state. Or perhaps a state that doesn't really exist at all. But how did Haiti get to this point? To find out, we need to go back a few hundred years. In 1791, the enslaved people of what's now Haiti launched a revolt against their French rulers. The ensuing 12-year series of conflicts ended in 1804, with the establishment of Haiti as an independent country, marking the first successful large-scale revolt by enslaved people in modern history. But it wasn't smooth sailing from there. Internal politics and social divisions, foreign meddling, natural disasters and disease have all hindered Haiti's economic and political development. Here's a non-exhaustive run-through of some of those factors. In 1825, in exchange for diplomatic recognition, and thanks to some strategically placed warships, France successfully demanded a monumental amount of reparations to make up for France's loss of income and property. That debt and interest wasn't paid off until 1947, by which it's estimated that Haiti had paid out the equivalent of 20 to 30 billion of today's US dollars. During this time, there was persistent political instability. Between 1843 and 1915, there were 20 successive rulers, 16 of whom were assassinated or overthrown. Then for, nearly, then, for nearly two decades, between 1915 and 1934, Haiti was occupied by US Marines, purportedly to restore order, but also to shore up American business interests in the country, as the US gained complete control over Haitian finances and security. Later on, 1957 marked the start of the combined 29-year autocratic rule of Francois Papadoc Duvalier and his son Jean-Claude, which was marked by rampant corruption, human rights abuses and an exodus of Haitian professionals. A popular uprising ended their dynasty in 1986, but did not result in a smooth transition to democracy, as violence marred aborted and boycotted elections over the next couple of years. Eventually, in 1991, Jean-Bertrand Aristide became Haiti's first ever democratically elected president, but was deposed by a military coup just months later, and then subsequently reinstated in 1994 thanks to a UN-backed US military intervention. He was forced out again in 2004, this time with the US and France allegedly behind his overthrow. In the wake of 2004, the UN Security Council authorised a peacekeeping mission to Haiti that would go on to last 15 years. During that time, in 2010, the country was devastated by a catastrophic earthquake that is thought to have killed nearly a quarter of a million people. Other natural disasters through the 2010s, including hurricanes and droughts, led to further deterioration. And in August 2021, Haiti's southern peninsula was hit by a major earthquake, and then a powerful tropical storm 
days later exacerbated the damage. Amid all this, the country's semi-permanent political turmoil continued. The delayed and disputed elections of 2015 to 16 eventually resulted in Jovenel Maurice being elected president, with him taking office in February 2017. But his presidency saw widespread protests and unrest over rising fuel prices, corruption and violent crime. On July the 7th, 2021, Maurice was assassinated, plunging the country into further crisis. Days before his assassination, President Maurice had designated Ariel Henry as Prime Minister, though Henry was never officially sworn in or approved by Parliament, as the terms of most lawmakers had expired a year earlier and fresh elections were never held. Nevertheless, despite a short dispute over who should become acting president following the assassination, Henry prevailed and remains president to this day. Henry pledged to hold elections, but these have been delayed amid the country's significant insecurity. In the absence of a functioning state, armed gangs, who in many cases have ties to those in power, have filled the void, leading to the situation we outlined earlier. Gangs are not new to Haiti, but the crisis has significantly escalated in recent years. The Haitian government has made repeated requests for international intervention to help take back control and restore order. So it's with all this in mind that the UN Security Council has finally given the green light for an international security force to intervene. With 13 votes in favour and Russia and China abstaining, the resolution passed authorising the intervention as well as expanding an existing arms embargo on Haitian gangs. Despite being UN authorised, the multinational force won't actually be under UN control. It will likely be led by Kenya, which has pledged 1,000 police officers to head the year-long mission. And there will also be participation from nearby countries, including Jamaica, the Bahamas and Antigua and Barbuda, while the US has pledged $100 million in financial support. A start date for the mission has not yet been set, and the force's exact makeup, rules of engagement, and exit strategy is yet to be worked out, though Kenya has already been preparing. As it was requested by Haiti's government and authorised by the UNSC, the operation can claim legitimacy. However, it will still prove controversial. For starters, many Haitians see Ariel Henry as an illegitimate president given the circumstances of his rise to power and the fact that the country hasn't held elections since 2016. For some, Henry's request for foreign intervention is seen as an attempt to shore up his own position. Additionally, Haitians have good reason to be sceptical of foreign intervention, given the country's history with occupation and external involvement, even recently. The 15 years of consecutive UN-led peacekeeping operations between 2004 and 2019 failed to result in lasting democratic change and left a dark legacy, including a deadly cholera outbreak attributed to UN peacekeepers and a horrific sexual abuse scandal. It's with this in mind that the UNSC resolution has also called for an oversight mechanism to ensure the highest standards of transparency, conduct and discipline for their personnel. It will be a massive task for the Kenyan-led mission to help the Haitian authorities wrestle back control from the gangs, and many have questioned whether they're capable of this. But the even greater task will be addressing Haiti's broader crisis, including its humanitarian, economic and political challenges, and fostering conditions for long-term stability. That's all we have time for today, but if you're the kind of person who wants to dive deeper into the more technical and analytical side of these stories, then you ought to check out The Daily Discussion, where our writing team are let loose to discuss stories just like this one, diving deeper into new stories and unpacking the hidden details that they found fascinating, but they're either too long or too academic to make it into the final script. If you want to check them out, you can find them exclusively on Nebula. And the best news is that Nebula is less than £2 a month and provides you with ad-free and exclusive videos from TLDR and a ton of incredible content from other creators like Johnny Harris, Real Life Law and Legal Eagle. Check it out by clicking on the link in the description and make sure you use our link so they know that you came from us.